Jackson, uh, how about you uh, Very start? Good. Well, with, I have uh, some questions for you today. We Say it again? Endings of Mark, right? All right, here's a very good question. And it's very simple, too. How can I talk to angels? Um, how, you, you answer that first. It can you to talk to angels. Just address angels and talk to them. The problem is that you don't know what kind of angel you're connecting up with. Because you certainly will have something answer you back in the short run. However, unless you have a great deal of discernment, you won't know whether that angelic being or spirit being is friendly or not. You are probably not going to get Casper the first time or one of the righteous angels. I have heard of a lot of people who say they talk to angels. Some talk to Gabriel, some talk to Mikael, supposedly. Nobody ever talks to Uriel. <laughs> no one is ever being able to call up Raphael, but they get some of these angels like Saint Germain and Primarily, pre-mortal types of entities that a person really doesn't want to interact with. I have known many people who have been hearing the voices. I even did a series on hearing voices that turned out not to be good voices, but actually over a period of time, invaded the lives of the people who were so inquisitive about them to the point where some of them went insane or some of them actually committed suicide because of what these voices were telling them. In fact, I know several people personally who have been inundated by voices because they called on something to call back. On them. This is something young people really want to get into, to be able to talk to supernatural beings. Some even call up demons purposely, not knowing what they're going to deal with. And many people, as you know, who are continually involved in sins and crimes, actually will admit that something is talking to them. It's something from somewhere else is contacting them. I have a real good recording of one particular person who had hands laid on on him in church, and uh, he didn't see who did. He was praying. Someone came and laid hands on him and walked out of church, and that fellow was cursed for years with hearing demonic voices telling him to do things, especially to destroy himself. So all, my, my opinion is you're best off not talking to angels. And those people who tell you you can talk with angels, though they're telling the truth, they're not telling you what kind of supernatural entity you might be coming into communication with. Because if you ask them, they will talk. If you set the table, they will come. If you leave the door open, they will attend to you. The problem is, just like unwanted guests, how do you get them to leave? And that's a question that's still up in the air. What do you think of that? Um, is that all you want to say on, on that? Sure, that's enough. Okay. Um, so it's funny because, uh, many years ago when I, in the first few years of you and my interactions online, 
I, you specifically being Jackson Snyder, um, our interactions have been, like in the past, I kind of felt like you, um, this was my impression in the past and I'm okay. saying it's funny because now I feel like it's reversed in some ways. Uh, basically at the time I thought that you uh, didn't really take the scriptures seriously as much um, in the sense of believing what they say. Um, I thought you were more along the lines of uh, the way a secular person might view uh, the Bible. Um, now, I would still maintain that you are closer to them in certain things, like um, like Apocrypha, for example, and uh, it's my understanding you kind of lean more towards them in the dating of different books. Um, but when it comes to spirituality, you are very much in line with um, at least what you have shared. Um, I don't know if, if what you say is different than what you believe on the topic of the whole, the different spiritual aspects, but from what you say, it sounds like you are very much in line with, uh, um, a typical, uh, biblical understanding of spiritual entities like angels, demons, and all those things. Are you things. thinking that I'm an angel? No, no, no. What I'm saying is uh, that basically um, my view on angels, demons, spirits in general is much more secular than what you have shared in a lot of your teachings, which I, I find surprising because, like I said, Years ago, I thought you were the more secular one. So it's kind of funny that in many ways I'm reversing that in, in recent years from my journey. But basically, to answer the question, uh, I, I gave all that as a prelude to what I'm saying. So basically, my take on this is, um, well, so first of all, I do believe in I believe in angels, I believe in demons and spirit spirit beings, but um, I have a very different understanding of how they interact with us than most believers. Um, in regards to trying to communicate with angels or demons or anything, I believe that that's pretty much something we're not allowed to do uh, in terms of initiating. So, you know, the scriptures talk about do not try to be in contact with the dead. Do not uh, commit necromancy. Now, spirits and angels are not dead, but demons are dead. Um, angels are not, but at the same time, the principle is we've never been sanctioned in scripture to communicate with angels, like to invoke them, to call them to us. You never see in any of the apocryphal books or any regular books of scripture a someone of the faith, and not even a, of the faith, but you don't see really anyone call out to a, a angel out of nowhere and say, come to me, I want to talk to you, or whatever. You, you never see that. It's always the angel appearing to them first. The angel is the one that initiates the conversation. Um not in my not in my experience, but maybe in yours. Uh, I'm not talking about experience. I'm just talking about what the what this um, what you see in scripture in the sense of you don't see in scripture examples of people trying to communicate with um, angelic like initiating the conversation with angelic beings. You see angels being sent because you know the word in Hebrew for angel is messenger. So. Um, when an angel speaks with someone, it's because they were sent on behalf of Yahweh to deliver a message to uh, the people. And the only thing that I see from scripture of uh, communicating would be, there is the Testament of Solomon, where Solomon basically gives instructions where if you, ha if you are um, possessed or someone you know is possessed with uh, a specific demon by name, 
you may, uh, you are, it says basically that each of the demons has a angel pointed over them that uh, is their authority where you can invoke the name of that angel um, to cast out the demon. Um, but I take that to be not you trying to communicate with the angel, but you basically, um, like, you know how people say, in the name of Jesus, blah, blah, blah. In the name of Jesus, leave demons, leave this person. Uh, or in the name of God or whatever. People say in the name of. When they say in the name of, they're not, they're not, com they're not talking to, to God or Jesus when they say in the name of this. They're saying, may this be done in the name of this. So in the same way, I believe when, when Solomon gives his instructions in the Testament of Solomon for demons, we are not invoking, we are not speaking directly to the angels and, and saying, Raphael, come and bind this demon. No, we're not saying that. Instead, we're saying, in the name of Raphael, be gone. So it's, it's an important distinction, I believe. Um, and also, I think it's worth noting that um, when you look at idolatry in Scripture, the sin of idolatry, and when you compare it to how the church reveres the saints and angels, you, did you know in the church angels are regarded as saints? There's Saint Michael, the archangel. There's Saint Raphael, the archangel. They are actually saints. They're called saints in, in the churches. Now, the word saint is fine, but the problem is because saint means holy, and we all should strive to be holy, so we should all strive to become saints. But the problem is the church puts on a pedestal saints, and they believe, a lot of the Christians believe in prayer to the saints. Prayer to the saints would, is communicating with, um, or asking, or petitioning. So, uh, pr prayer to... Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or pr pr prayer to one of the um, Christians in the Middle Ages who was a, a good Christian. Um, people appeal to these people. Uh, there's there's certain uh, Christian people who once lived, like I think it's um, maybe Francis, uh, who is the patron saint of lost things. So literally, Catholics will believe... What is it? I think that's St. Jude. Uh, it could be. I don't know. But one of the people is uh, patron saint of lost things. And what the, what the what Catholics yeah. do Francis, is they actually pray. They pray. The saint of animals. What is it? Saint of animals. It's oh, Francis. okay. St. Jude, you pray to St. Jude to find lost articles. Yeah. So... Praying to, praying to someone who's dead, saying, help me find uh, this lost thing, you are basically committing the sin of idolatry, um, in my understanding. And um, I, I'd have to explain it in another video of some time, uh, of some type in the future, where I could explain in more detail why I believe it's idolatry and the... Um, how that applies to worshiping other gods. You see, the thing is, I think the reason we're not, see the scripture speaks of, of a God of gods and, and it indicates that the angels are actually gods in, in, in the old Testament. So, um, so they are in fact gods, but we are told do not bow down to other gods. So it's not, scripture doesn't say that they're not gods. It simply says, do not worship other gods. Worship Yahweh. Don't worship these other gods beneath Yahweh. So, um, what is worship? I believe worship is, a, is giving um, power and serving a being, uh, putting it on a pedestal. Um, and so here's the thing. People, like someone said in the comments, uh, Mary. People pray to Mary. So, uh, 
how is it possible for Mary to hear everyone's prayers at the same time? You know, you have, you have like 2 billion Catholics. All the Catholics are praying t- to Mary every day, the rosary. You know, and they pray to Mary all the time. Unless you believe Mary is omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful, she cannot hear all prayer, all those prayers. The very act of even trying to pray to Mary implies that you believe Mary is a goddess that, and you are assigning her power that she does not have. So that is idolatry. It's equivalent to idolatry. Um, so with this, it becomes relevant in regards to angels. It's the same thing with angels. If you try to speak to an angel when the angel has not come down to you, you are essentially giving it a power it does not have. You can't, we can talk right now to each other through Zoom because that's the technology. But there's no technology that enables me to talk to Michael the Archangel right now. I can't say, Michael, come to me. And then Michael's going to hear me. Because Michael is not all here, all knowing, all everywhere. Michael's probably in another part of the world. So what would happen is Yahweh would have to tell Michael to come to me. He would have to tell Michael uh, that Onya wants you to come to him. And then he would have to travel. It would take a while for him to get here, potentially. I don't know how fast angels travel, but I don't believe that they can go wherever they want instantly. I don't think they have that power to just instantly transport somewhere else. Um, It's possible they do, but um, I think they're very much, I think angels and spirits are very much subject to the laws of nature, the laws of physics, um, and not the, the, I don't think they can do whatever they want. Um, So in that sense, I think it doesn't make sense to pray to, yeah, uh, three weeks, uh, three weeks delay, uh, Vicky said, um, in regards to one of the angels trying to help Daniel. He was unable to for three weeks. um, And that's in the book of Daniel. So yeah, um, I would say don't, my view is don't pray to, angels don't try to talk to them because talking to them is a form of prayer if an angel comes to you that's different they've initiated it so now just like you and i are having a conversation right now there's nothing wrong with that but if later tonight in my bed i'm trying to talk with jackson snyder and i say oh jackson snyder uh please upload my video you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to communicate with Jackson in a way that doesn't, it's not real. Um, it doesn't have that power. So, um, if I believe he can actually hear me, uh, that would be idolatrous. If on the other hand, you know, sometimes people just say things, but they don't actually believe that someone can hear them, but it's just like therapeutic, then that's a different story. Then, okay, they're just talking, you know, sometimes people talk out loud and say what they would like to say to someone. They wish someone could hear what they're saying. That's fine. But if you truly, sincerely believe that the person uh, has a direct line of communication with you, then that is a form of idolatry. So if you want to talk with Jackson Snyder, you got to use technology and talk with him the physical way. If Jackson comes to you and starts talking with you, then you, can, <laughs> then you can talk with him. What did you say, Jackson? If I call you on the phone, if I just come out of the air, <laughs> it's not me. He's yeah. a busy. He's a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you see, if you see Jackson Snyder come out of thin air, it's probably not Jackson. It's probably uh, uh, probably a, not a demon. Um, but another thing I just want to say, and then that'll be because I've talked a lot. But uh, basically, I believe that demons. I believe they exist, but I don't believe demons are what we think they are. I think demons are... So demons used to be uh, the Nephilim, according to scripture. They were the giants before the flood. I believe that. And they were the offspring of the fallen watchers. I believe that. But when the flood happened, all the, the demon, all the giants were killed in the flood. So what happened to their spirits? According to scripture, their spirits were trapped on the earth. As, and they became demons on the earth. So 
how were they trapped on the earth? Are they just spirits wandering around? As most people believe, I don't believe that. Instead, I believe that these spirits, these de- the spirits of the dead Nephilim, the giants, they basically were forced to enter into new bodies. And the bodies are what we know as viruses. It is my understanding that viruses, the scientific viruses, like, you know, use the microscope and you look at the microscope and you see viruses. I believe viruses are demons. Um, Not metaphorically, not spirit, you know, not like in a symbolic sense. I believe they, the viruses are literally the bodies of the demons where um, if you, if you look at the comparison between viruses and demons, there's some striking connections. Some interesting things is viruses imitate life, but according to scientists, they don't technically qualify as life. They're not quite life. Secondly, viruses cannot be active unless they have a host. They need a host to be active. Once they have a host, then they, they uh, thrive. Sounds like demon possession right there. A demon requires a host to be able to, to um, be active. And so th- there's other things too, which make me conclude that demons are in fact uh, viruses and viruses are demons. So, so when people say that uh, they're talking with demons, I actually, or they hear demons talk, I and more inclined to think that they, that it's more so in their head in the sense of demons as viruses might be causing you to have thoughts in your head but it's thoughts that are being put into your head it's not demons talking to you it's 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 thoughts so like for example um if you have a a virus that virus may try to uh, make you angrier than you might normally be it might make you irritable. So it might send thoughts into your head, be angry, be angry. But people, when people talk about demons, they make it sound like a demon appeared to them and they saw a demon and, and, um, and they, uh, like it was a divine miraculous encounter. I believe most of these people are actually interpreting what, what happened to them. And really what happened to them is that random thoughts were coming into their head and they say, oh, that's a demon. Because I would never think that. So that must be a demon. Have you ever had weird, intrusive thoughts in your head? And you think, that's not what I normally think. Right. Maybe, that's, maybe that's from a demon. But where I say maybe, other people say it definitely is. So I think, um, I think uh, there's a danger to that. Anyways, uh, John... Uh, thinks we should move on to a different topic. Well, that was interesting for sure. Anybody have any other comments? There, yeah, anyone want to sh- share their thoughts on what I said or what Jackson said? You know, if Louis Pasteur would have known all that, it would have made things a lot more simple. What is this? I said if Louis Pasteur would have known all that, it would have made things a lot more simple. I don't know who that is. Who is that? You don't know who Louis Pasteur, Pasteur? Um, uh, it's not ringing a bell. Uh, could you type out the name in the... Yes, he, uh, he created vaccines for viruses and discovered what viruses were. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't know him by name, so... No, that was just, I'm sorry, that was comic relief, but he's the one who <laughs> viruses were and how you create vaccines, so he would have made life a lot easier if he would have known all that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Jackson, what's another uh, question? I've been lo- lo- looking at a couple Bible quizzes online that are supposed to be hard. And I'm thinking every question in these qu- quizzes, I doubt that anyone online now would miss any of them. One particular one I thought I'd throw in is do you remember what? Elisha was afflicted with? 
we wouldn't think much of it these days, but evidently it was a pretty big thing then. And if you can't remember that, then you might remember that he was made fun of for this reason by children and that something happened to these children for making fun of him. How about that for a question? You know it? That was the hardest one I thought on there. Um, you remember when he was um, when he was made fun of by children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They pointed at him and they called him something. Yeah. Okay, what was it? Uh, going up, you bald head. That's right. <laughs> what happened to those children? Um, they took a nap. Yeah, after the bear had come after. <laughs> nice long nap. They, it, it, the thing is, um, it was uh, frankly unbearable what, 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 they were, uh, what they were doing to him. So. What were they doing besides taunting them? You um, well, the, the primary issue is, is um, because he was a prophet and they were basically mocking Yahweh himself by mocking his prophet. And um, it's a serious crime under the law of Moses. It's basically a capital crime if you um, if you um, blaspheme against Yahweh. So um, the reason they were killed by bears is because they deserve to die because they were pretty evil people to uh, blaspheme Yahweh, in my understanding. Most people try to sympathize with those those people, and they say, oh, those were they emphasize that they were kids, but in, rather than kids, they were probably more like teenagers. And teenagers are basically adults, um, not quite, but they're almost there. So it's not like six-year-olds being mauled by bears. That's what some people try to oh, make it like make it sound like. Older kids. Yeah, it's like 15, 16, 17 year olds. You know, the age where we have people who are that age can uh, are sometimes murderers. So they yeah. are, you know, they're they can be pretty evil people. Um, that's what, what I would say about that subject. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories, actually. It's a fun story. <laughs> in the Bible. Another question here that came in to me is about 1 Corinthians 14. And there's a passage in there where Paul's saying, did the word of Elohim originate with you? Or are you the only one who has reached? The context of this here, if I read it in context, is if they wish to inquire about something, they are to ask their own husbands at home, for it is dishonorable for a woman to speak in the church. I doubt that the word church is in there. Did the word of Elohim originate with you, or are you the only ones it is reached? If anyone considers himself a prophet or spiritual person, let him acknowledge that what I am writing you is the Lord's command. Well, we must be talking there to women, wives. It's another passage that looks like that he's talking down to women again. They can't speak in church. And they have to put uh, something on their head like a bird's nest so angels don't fall on them. And so Paul, in the middle of this, says, did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only ones who has reached? Now, that's the question. What is that all about? Um, I just want to say one thing. Um, I, I'm going to answer that. I want you to answer that first, but let me just say one thing, because I don't want to forget it. Um, uh, of what the earlier topic, there was one thing that I wanted to clarify. Okay. It's not It's not going to be long. Basically, I do believe that people can see the actual um, form of demons in their dreams, as well as hallucinations. People can hallucinate uh, through viruses. Viruses can cause them to hallucinate, as well as to mess with their dreams. So I don't want to people to think that I don't believe that people can actually see demons. I just think um, people uh, 
exaggerate their experiences sometimes. But anyways, uh, that's all I wanted to say about that. So Jackson, um, what is your thought on the well on what you just asked? My my speaker quit working. Am I working now? Yeah. Okay. I think that it's the normal Paul where he's telling women to, to shut up and that he's saying to women that did does the word of God come to women? Give me a break. Go ask your husbands what's said. The word of God doesn't come to you, it comes to men. I'm not sure that's what that means, but that's certainly what it looks like to me. Uh, and again, I think it's another one of Paul's either anti-woman prejudices or him trying to stay within the bounds of Roman law about women in assemblies. Because, you know, if, you're, if the women were taking over the assembly or anything else, a woman comes to the fore and does speaking, she and the man that is given uh, wardship over her could be arrested. And they could be punished severely for this, according to the to the Lex Julia and Lex Cornelia in Roman law. I just got a paper on that today. I haven't got time to look at it yet. But I, Paul just doesn't want these women to talk. Not, of course, I, I'm against that. I don't think that Paul necessarily is bringing a word of the Lord or not. Why didn't Yahshua say the same thing? Yahshua said just the opposite of that. He seems to have empowered women, unlike the rest of Judaism at that time, did not. And we know that there were some pagan cults like uh, Diana cult or Artemis cult that had women who were leaders of that. But primarily, according to these Roman laws, you couldn't do that. Paul being over women that were doing that, that could put him in jail. I know that sounds ridiculous today, but it's a fact for those days. So sometimes I don't think maybe it's, it's Paul's prejudices against women. And, you know, he might have a reason for that. I don't know if you know the story about Paul coming to Jerusalem to marry the high priest's daughter. That's Caiaphas's daughter, whom they recently found the ossuary of in the Caiaphas tomb. But... If you learn the whole story, you'll find that Paul took on the job of persecuting the Nazarenes for Caiaphas with the promise of receiving his daughter in return for doing that and his the possibility of him becoming a high priest at one time or the other, like Caiaphas himself became a high priest through marriage. Just throw that out to you, and you'll excuse me for a minute. I have to go to the next room here. I'll be right back. Okay. Um. So. Yeah, speaking tongues, women can't do those things. Um. So. Basically, Jackson, you said you're stepping out for a bit. Be right back. Yeah. Okay. Um. I might wait until he gets back, actually, because I'd rather him be uh, hearing what uh, I have to say. So um, do, let's talk about, maybe we can talk about something else while we wait. Uh, so um, let's see here. So, John, what, what are you specifically referring to uh, regarding Joel chapter 2? Um are you saying we uh, we said something incorrectly last time? Or it's, just, it's in another verse? Okay, uh, so the statement was um, in, there is no mention of mountains and islands in Joel chapter 2. Apparently someone said that it was from Joel chapter 2, uh, but it's actually from Revelation chapter 6, 
verse uh, 14. And it says, And heaven departed like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Um, you think so, the whole world? What was it? So, 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 so uh, Onya, if you'll read back through the messages, um, the point, the discourse, because there was a question from last week about Joel 2 and about how we, where we place this, how we place this. Um, and then as I read back through all of Joel, I was looking, you know, how the mountains and islands play a part. Just found that it wasn't there, that it was in Revelation 6. Um, oh, okay. And, and how that chapter plays in role with Revelation 6. Uh, just to hear your, you two's, you know, opinion on that. Okay. Um, Jackson, is Jackson back? Yeah, I'm here. I never um, heard of that. Could you tell me what it was again? Uh, basically, uh, the question was asked about uh, something we were talking about last week uh, with Joel chapter 2 uh, in relation, in, in a connection to Revelation. Um, However, I think now that Jackson's back, um, we'll touch upon that next. But I think we should try to uh, finish the current uh, subject we're on before no, we yeah, move. Yes, of course. I was just, it was something that I put for further discourse for the next question because it was a topic that we ended on last week. And there were kind of uh, verbal assignments given out. Hey, give us more on this, or look into more on right. this. So, so I went ahead and, and did more on that. Uh, well, I remember when I when I kind of wondered, what are you talking about, Joel two? Right. That, yeah. that, that, that wasn't that wasn't my question. It didn't ring a bell. A question that I had remembered and I was following up on, and that Jackson you had asked to give. Uh, for someone to, you know, look into that more. Um, so I went ahead and did that to line up that verbiage. And I just found it was in, in, in two different, you know, places, which we would call, and not to call it in a negative fashion, but trail mix when we grab different books and combine it into one event. Potentially so, when they're not talking about, potentially they're, when they're not talking about the same event. Potentially, but in a way they could be um, because we know uh, this time and event that these two chapters are talking about. I was just wanting to hear the discourse between you two after this, obviously, this topic. That's all. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so I did want to say about the subject of, um, it's from First Corinthians, right, what we were reading? Yes, it, it appears to be an another slur against the against the intelligence of women so i would say first of all regardless of your view on paul i don't think i'm not inclined so much towards the view that it's because of 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 trying to please uh romans um you just you mentioned earlier in your answer how judaism didn't necessarily have the the best uh, view towards the woman either um and, you know, Paul did come from that Pharisee group. I believe he, he didn't, um, I believe he changed a lot of his views more towards the Essene way, but perhaps some of his ideas were still influenced by his Pharisee upbringing. But um, another thing interesting is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it actually says in one of the fragments, it says, um, if the, it either says fathers or or the male elders. And it also says mothers or the female el elders. I don't remember if it says fathers and mothers or male elders and female elders, one of the two. But basically what it says is that the, the men of the group, if you speak against them, um, it's a much higher punishment than if you speak against the woman of the group. Um, whether you agree with that or not, it's an indication that, you know, the Jews and in general didn't necessarily have uh, views of women that people in modern times would find acceptable. Uh, but there's other, there's plenty of other stuff in the Old Testament, in the Law of Moses, 
which paints woman in a less flattering light. Like you have um, the bride price, you know, uh, women have to be sold by their fathers uh, for, for money. Um, but men never are. They've never described a bridegroom price ever in scripture. Um, but there's other things too, like in, according to Leviticus, women are actually worth less than men for valuation. Um, when your valuation for a vow, um, men are worth more shekels than women for each age group. Uh, so th there's all a bunch of things like that, which, um, but we also know in the law of Moses, uh, women cannot be priests. Uh, and there's some, some sensible reasons for that, I believe. Uh, but, uh, you know, some people might disagree and think women should be able to be priests. Um, but you have that, you have, uh, inheritance is passed through the father line, the, the patrilineal line. Um, so, and there's, there's other stuff too. I haven't said it all, but yeah, inheritance goes through the, through the male line rather than female line. And, uh, so I say all that because I'm inclined to actually more towards agree with Paul, but with a caveat that if you look at what Paul says, there's a couple things important. First of all, elsewhere in his letters, he mentions prophetesses in the church, uh, woman prophesying in the church so evidently unless he's contradicting himself which he could be contradicting himself but he, you wouldn't think he'd be contradicting himself that badly or that blatantly um he actually does say that women may speak by the holy spirit in the church so uh the woman prophetesses but they have to speak in turn uh and i think perhaps justification for that could be that uh, when women are speaking as a prophetess, it's not the woman speaking, it's, it's Yahweh speaking. So it's okay because it's not really the woman speaking. The woman is just conveying the message. Um, but when it comes to speaking in church, you notice an emphasis on, he says, women shall be silent in church. And we know from some apocryphal writings, but as well as from the New Testament, uh, the church is very much a symbolism, a symbolic uh, representation of spiritual realities. So uh, there is some importance, I believe, for respecting proper order in the church, because uh, in these extra books of the, in the, some extra books of the New Testament in the Ethiopian Bible, there uh, are documents which, uh, give extra commandments and some of these extra commandments actually further explain or give more context to some of what Paul says. And um, basically, oh man, I, I lost, I was gonna say something specific. Uh, that's why I mentioned the, the books of the New Testament from the Ethiopian Bible. Um, but I would say that, uh, oh, Paul did say, uh, in the Acts of Paul, uh, that, uh, he actually commanded Thecla to go out and preach to, to, uh, unbelievers. So Paul did believe women can, can talk and preach, but that they were not to preach in church. And so that's my take on it. All right. Listen. You don't think it's possible, and I'm not speaking against Paul. Paul's just a human being. Maybe he had sexual hang-ups. In the Panarian by Epiphanius, Epiphanius writes down something from the Ebionite Gospel, and this is what he writes. When he's speaking of the Ebionites, they, that is the Ebionites, declare that Paul was raised in a pagan household. He went up to Jerusalem, and when he had spent some time there, was seized with a passion to marry the daughter of the high priest. And this was the reason he became a proselyte of the Jews and went through the Jewish ritual of circumcision. But when the lady rejected him, he flew into a rage and wrote against circumcision 
and against the Sabbath and the Jewish law. That according to the Panarian 30, 16, 6. Now, um, I, evidently, that was something that was known of Paul at that time. It's the fourth century. And I don't think that Epiphanius, who was um, a, a rank and file Catholic Christians of the time, the Constantine type Christians of the time, would write something that seems to be derogatory about Paul if it wasn't true, at least coming from the mouths of the Ebionites, which of course could have gone back to the first century and right back to Paul. And my understanding was that actually the high priest was Caiaphas and that his daughter or granddaughter that he fell in love with, her name was Mary or Miriam and her ossuary, her bone box was actually found in the Caiaphas tomb just within the last 10 years. So, Again, some of these things that seem outrageous to us, like we wouldn't even think about, especially if you go into a, a Catholic or a, into a, a charismatic church that women couldn't speak. But if you go into a Baptist church today, a woman can't just get up and speak. And this idea has continued on women can't be ordained in most places i think that there's something wrong with that and one of the one of the places in literature i can point to is to this particular saying here jerome also says that paul wasn't born in tarsus he was born in a pagan household in galilee and that he went up to Rome or went up to Tarsus in the dispersion when there was a persecution of these types in Galilee. He went up there and, and grew up in um, Tarsus where he had a complete Greek theological education before he came down to Rome. There's just so, so much history here missing that we can't really see why he does some of these things. The best I could do with it is look into the Roman laws. Because, you know, he seems to dump circumcision too. And don't say he didn't, because you can go through his sayings there and you, you will come to the conclusion that Paul did dump circumcision so they could go up to Europe. Because circumcision also was highly illegal there. The Romans consider that to be genital mutilation. So uh, we need more on these things. And this quote from the Ebionites by Epiphanius certainly seems plausible to me. What about to you? Um, so I did remember what I was going to say, um, why I brought the New Testament of the Ethiopian uh, church up is because in their documents, of, which is claimed to be from the apostles, the apostles actually say that the church, like church buildings specifically, are intended to be analogous to the temple and the tabernacle mentioned in the Law of Moses. So basically, um, a tabernacle or temple was to be built for uh, priests uh, to serve him. So that's in the Law of Moses. In the New Covenant, according to these extra books, the priests of a church are actually literal priests in a literal temple. And so it would follow that the laws of the Law of Moses, which, like I mentioned, um, the laws of the Law of Moses do not allow women to be priests. So it would follow in that same line of thought that if the early Christian believers or the early uh, apostolic believers were derived from the Essenes, um, then 
their teachings on the church would be very similar to what the Essenes taught for the law of Moses, which would be that women cannot be priests. And the idea of a, when it says um, women are not to, to uh, speak in church, it's my understanding that's specifically in reference to speak in a teaching role. Um, like, I don't think, you know, you know how churches have uh, peace, like, peace of the Lord be with you, and then they, they greet each other, and, and they can talk with each other and say, hi, how are you doing? I don't think it's saying they're not allowed to talk, but that when, when, um, when people are sitting down, and the liturgy is going on, and the service is going on, the priests are performing their, the, what they do, and, and they're giving their sermon, the woman is not to give the sermon because it is the priest's responsibility and a, a, a woman's not allowed to be a priest. That, from my understanding, is, is pretty much the only reason uh, why women are not supposed to talk uh, in church. That's what I would say. But in regards to what Epiphanius said, um, um, thing to keep in mind. So first of all, a lot of people say that a lot of skeptics of Epithanius say that he says some things that are hard to believe. Um, but I would take a middle approach in the sense that I don't think he just made things up. I think that he heard things from other people and he wrote down what these people were telling him. So he heard that the Ebionites or a group claimed to be Ebionites because they were different factions of Ebionites. One of the groups of the Ebionites or maybe the major group at that time, was saying this about Paul, because we know that even it's different Paul. So at the same time, if you look at that explanation, throughout the years, I have uh, tried to give people the benefit of the doubt. I've tried to evaluate people's motives and why they do what they do and why they say what they say, why they believe what they believe. And I can say that that explanation from the Ebionites very much sounds like a, a, um, an afterthought of like trying to demonize Paul and making him look, uh, uh, basically coming up with an accusation. Well, to try that to could be, but it. it seems to me like a reasonable. It seems reasonable. It doesn't just seem like it was made up. And certainly in the Ebionites' time, there, they could produce some type of biographical information that might support that. Why, you know, I'm wondering if it was completely a heretical and untrue saying that Epiphanius would even record it from them. But of course, he talks about heresies. A yeah. hundred heresies in there. And so what is, I don't know. What is, I think that there's something to it. What does Epiphanius say? Does he say um does he say that um he tr he tried to pursue a woman and she rejected him or Yes, exactly. The, the high priest That's what wife, that's what it uh, says. A high priest's daughter. The high so, priest would be of course probably Caiaphas. So let's let's give benefit of the doubt for that idea, and let's say um, that there was a high priest that he was interested in, and and she rejected him. Um, that could be true, but what follows, I think, is not compelling to me. What follows is that because of her rejecting him, um, he. Uh, started teaching against circumcision and all these different things. To me, that's, that's a, a big leap. But the first part, I can believe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not entire. I could see that as plausible. Um, he was interested in a woman, you know. I have my share of, uh, my yeah. shady past of being interested in certain women. Maybe, yeah. I shouldn't be, maybe I shouldn't be interested in, in them, you know. Solomon as well. Solomon was interested in, in lots of women he should not have been. Um, so it certainly is... a possible thing but i would have a hard time thinking that his total mission in life is all because he was just trying to um get 
revenge against being rejected. Um, because if you read Paul's letters, there's a lot of depth to it, and it really seems like Paul truly believes what he's writing. Um, whether he whether he's right or not, it sounds like he sincerely thinks he's correct in what he says. Um, so I would have a hard time thinking that he's just making all this up and he's just saying bad things because he wants because he's mad about being uh, rejected. Uh, so that, that's what I would say on that. Do you remember the first time you were rejected? Does it affect you still now? I sure do. It still um, affects me even now, you know, 60 years ago. Well, I, I don't, I don't, every, I only mean that rhetorically. I don't yes. mean that you need to recount your no, life or anything. I'll just say everything affects us still from our past. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm going to answer that though. Basically, um, there have been some rejections which have extremely. Um, gripped gripped me and, and made it uh, very and it still impacts me to this day but my first rejection i'll be happy to say does not have that same effect uh, basically um i was pretty much you know i was i was sad but uh i have no bitterness or anger towards it or anything you know i, I had no no real scars from that first rejection um, I respected their decision, and I believe that they fully had the right to choose who they want to be with. So, you know, I didn't take it personally. I just was sad, disappointed. But uh, but then there's other times, rejections, which I did take personally, and it did severely uh, affect me negatively, and, and in some ways still does uh, in certain areas. So, um, yeah. But I would say, uh, just a final thing, um, I, I'm i very much Law of Moses oriented. I'm very much the Essenes. So just pretend Paul doesn't exist. I go with what the Essenes believed and what the Torah says. And, the, and they have a less than pleasant view towards women, pleasant in the sense of what we would consider pleasant in modern times. Um, but I very much believe in the ethics and morality of the law of Moses, even the stuff it says about women, slavery, and a bunch of other stuff, I believe that it's true. Uh, but I understand why people in modern times disagree. But I think if you approach the scriptures from the ancient perspective and the ancient culture, you will, see, and you try to understand why these things were said, why were these commands given, why were these statements said about women in, in what seems to be a negative way in the law of Moses? Once you st start searching deeper for why were those laws given, the answers might surprise you and you might come to realize, okay, those answers make sense and that makes sense why women are not supposed to be priests. Um, so I, I would encourage people to, to seek for the answer about women in the law of Moses because I think that's where you're you'll find. Ignore Paul, because Paul, you know, I believe Paul is an authority, but people d don't always agree with that, and some of what Paul says is not corroborated, at least in our current New Testament. There are other books of the Apocrypha which corroborate what Paul says, but a lot of people only have the New Testament. So, um, in regards to the New Testament books, a lot of people only have the New Testament and not the New Testament Apocrypha. So, um, for those who only have the New Testament uh, for the ap apostolic teachings, then you may not be convinced of what Paul says about women. So then ignore what Paul says. Go with the Torah. Go with what the Dead Sea Scrolls says. They speak very clearly about the, the way women are to be compared to men. And I, I agree with those ancient documents. So people may disagree, but you know that's for you guys to figure out for yourselves how much of what the scripture says is still relevant or applicable today. Is it different now that we are in the modern time that we are? Are you a uh, male so chauvinist? A chauvinist a pig? A male chauvinist <laughs> pig? Um, I think that's, a, that's what uh, feminism would call it, it. It depends who you ask, you know. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so did you have any, did you want to respond to what I said, Jackson, or do you want to move on no. to the next question? No, you did a good job. I mean, you told what you feel about it and it made sense. And I you would like to know said... what other people on here think about women speaking in the assembly. That yeah, would... you guys want to share? take a poll on that. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, if we think about it, most of us men, whom are we, I mean, well, and I'm not going to say all, but some of us, and, and maybe this is just an example of myself, being from a single mother, that raised me my whole life under the word and I had a father that did not believe at all and to think that a woman can't lead a man I mean even the Israelites would even go to war without a woman um, so no <laughs> you know I, I do not agree that women uh, should not be able to speak because most of us men wouldn't be what we are to say. I would agree with Chris, because if you look at the stories of the Bible, all the miracles and stuff were shown to women first, not men. Even, even after he uh, resurrected, it was to a woman, not a man. Well, I, let, me, let me just ask you guys a question. Just, I want to understand what you, what your guys' perspective is, because I think this will help explain why I believe what I do and why you guys might believe what you do. So Levit um, Leviticus specifically states that um, that woman that uh, woman cannot be priests. So um, do you guys agree with that interpretation or would you say that Leviticus doesn't say that? Those are temple priests. Yeah, yeah right. I don't deal with the temple anymore. Yeah, so pre, I'm just wondering pre, if you guys agree with uh, that understanding of Leviticus. Do we are okay. we on the same page for that? Well, yeah, I mean, of a temple priest, or yeah, no, then yeah, but no. <laughs> well, look, look at the bigger, look at the bigger picture. I mean, a woman raising a child, there there's a lot to that, and doing the priesthood, there's a lot to that, and I think the Almighty knows that you know you can only get stretched so far so he puts limits on things and i think that's kind of why he put the restrictions there so the woman could focus on the child that's good bo good for you so my, my yeah. basics uh my, the basis for my belief is based on uh what i mentioned of the new extra books of the new testament of the ethiopian bible where they basically claim now the key in mind this is a claim so it's contingent on these books being correct in what they're saying, but they're claiming that, uh, according, according to these books, the apostles stated that the church is not just a congregation or a meeting, but it's an actual temple and that the leaders of the church are actual temple priests. Not they're, they're not like just leaders, but they're actual temple priests and that the laws of Leviticus are the same application to the the temples of the new covenant um that's what they claim in those documents so because of that it is my understanding that that's where this that's where these statements about women speaking in church are coming from it all is contingent on whether church is a temple or not and most people in the messianic movement most protestants do not believe that churches are temples and that priests are actual priests, temple priests. I think that's where the difference is and why there might be a difference of belief on the issue. That's just my perspective. Well, and yes, I mean, you know, I mean, things have obviously changed, but like, like you said, a temple priest, we hear the lines, you can look at through the Dead Sea Scrolls, the lines of the priesthood. I love the women, and yes, they are very authoritative and they have every right to be. But in those lines, there's never a woman given uh, when it comes to those priestly lines. Now, um, prophetess, completely different story. You've also had some female judges in the Old Testament. Um, like yes. De Deborah. Yeah. Uh, so there may be some, some 
potential for uh, female judges, which would be a form of uh, authority uh, of women over men. We also know that um, in the law of Moses, um, women could actually uh, own servants, uh, uh, men, men uh, male servants. So women could be the masters over their male servants. Uh, so there are, there are examples like that. Um, but yeah, I, so I think, I think the, inter the people's interpretation of what Paul is saying really comes down to what is church. So if church is not a temple and the, and the people speaking in church are not priests, then there's no reason why women should not be able to talk in church. The idea that women could not, like, let's say you guys have a Bible study. It would be, to me, it'd be ridiculous to say that in a Bible study, women could not talk and share their opinion. That's what some people believe. They said, some people believe that when, when men and women are gathered together for a Bible study, women cannot talk. To me, that's crazy. That doesn't make sense. I don't think the scriptures say that. Um, but some people, based on what Paul says, say, Women cannot talk in a in a uh, gathering of believers, um, but I, 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 if that's what church is, then I cannot agree with what Paul says. On the other hand, if church is a temple and speaking is only priests are to speak in a church, then that would mean that only men can speak in a church because only men can be priests. Uh, that's my logic there. So, could um, I offer a female perspective? Or sure. am I allowed to speak? Uh, <laughs> who's, who, who's who's this? This is Vicky. Did, did you want to? Did you did you want did you want to actually offer a perspective, or were you just? I really to make do. Joke? Yes, I do. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, no, yeah. I wanted. I, I do want to offer a, a perspective. I agree with you, Andrew, and I also agree with Jackson, and I also agree with John. I think it is. I, well, because no, I think just, that hey, all, what about me? <laughs> who's me? Bo. Bo. I didn't hear what you said, Bo. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, but I mean, anyways, I probably, keep going. I sorry. Did. But any, anyway, I do believe, and, and I, the, the one thing I'm definitely not is a feminist. I think it's destroyed society, feminism. But that's a social issue. But I do believe, I, I agree with y'all, it is very important the woman's role in the family is so important. And I think sometimes we forget, and I know this sounds kind of um, simplistic, but the reality is that in the creation story, when Yahweh created Adam, he did say, it's not good for him to be alone. This isn't gonna work with just him. And the female was, the final creation that's the magnum opus and i think that when we talk about uh the woman coming from uh the side of the man i think it really probably has more to do with the back side as far as like the back of the rib and you've got a man and a woman that stand back to back and then he's got her back She's got his back, and that's what makes them as one and a God. So I think that there, I think that Yahweh really views things really more uh, strongly toward women. But I think that a lot of what you read in the Old Testament does come from a patriarchal point of view, just because they did live in a patriarchal society. But I don't think that it meant um, necessarily that she was looked down upon. And I think that that is where a lot of people want to say that the woman is less than the man and, and uh, um, that Paul says women should not speak and, and things like that. And I'm, I'm just not convinced that that's really Yahweh's perspective on his final creation to make the man whole a whole piece that's kind of my take in a nutshell yeah i mean uh it's adam and eve not adam and steve right they say 
um, because the basic idea of um, pe pe some people try to make it all about men. It's just men, but of course, uh, the feminine aspect is important. And um, like, I don't think you can have one without the other. You just can't. Like, for example, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, most people believe it's a three. Most Trinitarians uh, believe that the three are all males. Um, the Father is male, Holy Spirit is male, and the Son is male. But there's evidence in the extra books that the Holy Spirit is actually was re actually regarded as the divine feminine counterpart yes. of, of the Father. So and that and that very much fits with um, the picture of Adam and Eve because you have Adam, he wasn't born, just like the father was unbegotten. And then you have Eve, she was pro she proceeded from uh, Adam's side. She wasn't uh, born, but she came out of him, proceeded from him. Right. In the same way, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And well, like, it fits the narrative. It fits the narrative of the creation. Yeah. Because he's, he says, let us create them in our image. Let us create them male and female. So there has to be a female image in order to say, let us create them in our image. Can I, ever, I, uh, ex I want to butt in real quick to kind sure. of compliment what you're saying. <clears throat> Somebody once told me, if you look at the Holy Spirit's attributes... It's a lot of women attributes, uh, like the mother comforts, uh, all that stuff. And it's like, wow, that's, that was beautiful. Never saw it like that before. Um, and I just want to piggyback off that. And just something I've been listening to, uh, with Jackson doing the inner way study. Um, and then I believe, and Jackson, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, one of the books... Uh, no, I'm sorry. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, when the, there's a, I believe there's a conversation between the disciples and Yahshua, um, and it's about, um, you know, it, it's a play off the parables. When you make the inner way like, like the outer way, and you make the outer way like the inner way, you make the two like one, you make the male and the female as one. Jackson, can you can you? Um, That's in Christian Apocrypha, or yeah. it's in New Testament Apocrypha. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so there we go. That's just another piggyback to make both as one. It's just you know take the male and the female from the ruach of wisdom, and to make the inner like the outer, the outer like the inner. It's just, it's just there. There's a study that Jackson did on the inner way, and then, of course, what you just said with that with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I I did want to say um, about what uh, was shared about um, the patriarchal uh, perspective. Um, I do think that you know some things may not necessarily be of Yahweh's uh, perspective, and that some of it came from there patriarchal perspective. On the, on the other hand, there are actual passages which are stated to be Yahweh's direct command. And some of the things about women are specifically commands from Yahweh. And so I am kind of believe that those commands are truly what Yahweh said. So we have to look into why did he say it? Um, what did he actually, did he, does, did what he say fit his core, uh, view towards women and then if it did what does that mean because i think many times people might see something in scripture and then they'll run with it and they will uh, twist it beyond what it was originally saying so you could have certain statements about women and they could be taken out of context for example um it's in leviticus it talks about people making a vow and it says like for each age bracket if someone is between the ages of zero and five, their valuation shall be this amount if they are male, this amount if they are female. And for each age bracket, it gives you the number of shekels that that person should be valued for for their vow. It's all, for each age group, 
the woman is always of a lower shekel value, value than the man is. So someone could take that passage right away and they say, oh, see, the, the Bible says that women are, are not, uh, they're not as much value. They, they are worth less than men are. Um, but that's not necessarily what the passage is saying. It may only be talking about their social uh, value in the sense of what they can do for a job because men are more, more stronger physically. And in those times we didn't have like technology jobs. We didn't have all these amazing jobs we could do. So most of the jobs were hardcore physical labor jobs. So men were more capable. So that meant that they had more potential. And because of that, um, their, their greater work potential meant that they were to have a higher valuation. That wasn't saying that men are more, are superior to women. It just meant that men are more valuable economically for a social role of doing physical labor. So there's things like that where they may, it may be truly what Yahweh's view on is, but it may be distorted from what, how we interpret it. Uh, so hopefully what I said encourages people to um, look at what scripture says about women and not reject what it says, but also to be careful and not use it to justify um, sexist ideas or misogyny. And uh, I agree with, I agree with you, Andrew and King David and his many wives are a prime example of, just because something is in the narrative does not mean that it is approved by Yahweh because clearly he said in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 17, that he did not want the kings to multiply their wives. Yet the kings did so. And they were, I don't recall ever seeing a single rebuke of David for the many wives that he had. Well, so, guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, You've probably heard me talk about this, maybe. I'm not sure. But the Temple Scroll uh, condemns what David did. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a, a document called the Damascus Document, which condemns it. We also have other prophet books that once existed, that the Bible says once existed, which are lost, like the Book of Samuel and the Book of Nathan. Oh. And we actually have a quote from the Book of Nathan, or a summary of a special apocryphal passage which uh, basically um, the passage from this lost apocryphal book of Nathan was that um, Nathan received prophecy from uh, Yahweh that David was going to sin with Bathsheba. And Nathan was sent by Yahweh to warn David. But on the way, Satan uh, killed someone. Uh, and so Nathan had to deal with that. And because he had to deal with that, he was not able to stop David in time. And David went and did the sin. So right. that then would lead to Nathan rebuking David. And um, I, I think in the book of Nathan, there was more rebuke of David, of David and that there would be rebuke of his taking other wives. Um, and I hope to show evidence of that in some other thing. Um, okay, and yes, David was forgiven, as Jackson said. The exhortations from the scrolls, the Damascus document, says that David was forgiven for that uh, sin that he did. Now, um, the final, uh, the, the temple scroll, uh, the, which passage, Laura? Um, you're asking. I'll, I'll tell you later, Laura. You message me uh, on Facebook. Um, so basically, uh, we have a little bit of time left, uh, but not too much time. But um, um, all right. Wait. Okay. Uh, Melissa asked the question, and then we will. We might not be able to answer it. We might need to put stuff off for the next one. Uh, but. 
type your question. Um, uh, John, could could you uh, type out the question? Um, no, I'll tell it to you. Let's go over the difference of Joel 2, Revelation 6, verse 14, as if we all want to even keep Revelation 6 in context. How do they mirror image and the discourse between Jackson and you? Um, this can be a big theological hiccup for some. So we, this is something that we agreed last week is very important. And we actually ended the session with it. Um, now, you can put it off till next week or whatever, but, you know, this needs to be explained from a historical view. It also needs to be explained from a possible theoristic view. If there is one, but I would like to hear uh, both because this was a very important question that we so, said that we that, that we said we would cover this week. So specifically, uh, those two chapters in the specific. Yeah. Um. The the, the problem is, it would probably take more time than we have left because Jackson usually likes to keep it to an hour and a half. Yeah, um, I know. I know that. That's that's, that's kind of, my concern. That, that's why I brought it up earlier because yeah. we, that we would discuss it as and I remember um, some assignments being put out to a couple. Well, hey, get us more on that and let's talk about it next week. So, Ania, why don't you have a Zoom account? Um, well, I have a I have a uh, Zoom account. I just haven't been doing uh, Zoom meetings uh, weekly. The, the the thing is, um, it, it's hard to commit to a regular uh, a regular Bible study. Well, give um, us your Zoom address, and then if he doesn't want to do it, then we can continue on. Because I have some questions. I want to know what it means where. Yeshua says that you can't put new wine in old wineskins or it will burst. And he says, if somebody's had the old wine, he doesn't want the new. He thinks the old is better. I want to know what your take is on that. And then I wanted to tell you what my take was. Oh, that actually, I can actually help with that. Jackson does a good deal on the inner way. It's actually about finding your inner man and how, you know, nothing old fits into anything new as you every parable that the messiah gave it was always for a high meaning. it was never for a literal meaning everything was always given for you to grow high in your maturity and understanding of your inner man your inner understanding your separation from the world and what is materialistic and what gives you life as opposed to what is old. You can't put that old stuff into a new being. That's my interpretation. Um, Melissa, why don't you share your take on it? Be well, I, I, I want to I basically spend some time this week thinking about it, because I've thought about it in the past, but I want to kind of think about it again. Uh, but what's your take on it? I thought it was talking about how he was bringing a new doctrine, and everybody said... When he it says in the scriptures that when he was in the synagogue, people said, what is this new doctrine? What is this new teaching? And then he said, you know, new wine needs new wineskins. Basically, you need to be born again. You need to be a new man to take exactly. the And exactly. then a lot of people don't want it because they would, that's why they got mad at him that he was bringing new doctrine. And they, but that's yeah. my. They've got to find that man. They got to find what it means to not go with their old doctrine, find the innocent way, find that way of that inner man. And then it's not worldly. And we have to look deeper than the surface of the parable of what he's talking about. Of course, he, it has to do with the new covenant. Oh yes, completely. Because the new covenant is completely about the inner man on how, we separate 
from tradition and the pharisaical, the physical humanistic senses that we can see what we think that makes us set apart or some use the word holy by letting your left hand know what, the, what your right hand is doing. And I'm not, and, and, and when I say giving alms, I mean, this is in mercies. This is in everything that you do. And when it comes to, okay, I'm not looking for a reward for what I'm doing. I'm doing it because it feels right. It feels good. Then your inner man and that doctrine, that old doctrine that they're teaching, nothing new when you're learning a new, it even speaks of, I believe, uh, one of the writings of, and pardon me if I'm wrong, it would be of Solomon, maybe, but, or, it, no, I'm sorry, it's Proverbs, when it says, come who are, come who are simple-minded, sit at my table, drink the wine that I mix. Now we're getting back to the wine again. So this is a wine of wisdom. It's, it's a higher understanding. It's not a wine of delusion. It's a uh, how to, like you, you even said, how, you know, a different man. And for us to separate from that, and I mean, it, it, it's kind of hard for me to explain unless you, I don't know. I'm not going to say you don't understand, but you're on the right path. It's just we have to understand what the old wine in us being a new being, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And if we're an old wine skin, the new wine it definitely will not work. Um, there's, so, a there's a scripture that says shaken down, stirred up. And I think that kind of goes along with what they're talking about also. So I just want to say, um, like I said, uh, I, I've had an answer for this before, but you know, um, I want to re I want to revisit it because it's been a long time since I came to that idea and I kind of forget what I came to. So I got to study it again because I don't want to just talk and say random stuff that comes to my mind. I want to make sure that my interpretation is reasonable and thought out and makes sense to what I know and what I see in scripture. Um, so I'm going to get back to you on that. As far as uh, the possibility of a of me doing a zoom thing at some point. That, that's something we can think about. Uh, for now, like this, uh, today, I don't, I'm not um, able to do that at the moment, uh, just mentally. Um, but we can, if we plan, if we plan ahead and I know in advance what we're going to be doing, um, we can definitely think about possible additional uh, studies that we can do together beyond what we're doing with Jackson. I like this weekly thing that we're doing. Um, I want to keep doing it with Jackson. 